actually communicate with one another about communication. So we kind of, it's an uphill battle, and we're not there yet, but it's a start. Um, we also engage, as uh, Marta mentioned, with researchers on policy, so in, in terms of not just getting the policy um, providers to come in and talk to our research community, but also to, for our research community to discuss policies and decide whether or not we want to go back to the funders and make decisions about perhaps altering those funds, altering those policies, I mean. Um, and the, a, an external example of our activity is a letter we wrote to Blood, which is a journal that is a very uh, well, uh, has a very high impact factor. Our researchers like to publish in Blood because it's a bit fancy. But the problem is that Blood actually doesn't let the researcher actually uh, uh, com um, comply with the policies of our funders. They're American. They don't seem to know that the UK exists. So we write a letter to them and say, why don't you change your policies. All you need to do is this little thing, and that means all of our research in the UK can actually get published with you because you're just kind of being um, being a bit stubborn about this. And so their response was Nothing. deafening silence. Um, <laughs> anyway, we tried. <laughs> and um, we also, we're involved in other sort of external practitioner groups like the Arts <coughs> Open Access Practitioner Group. Um, so we celebrate the, uh, the Cambridge Library community and their activism and activities in a monthly newsletter which highlights all the great activities and engagement and demonstrates how libraries enrich research and teaching support in the university. Now this is a publication that not only celebrates um, different libraries across the university but uses lots of people to, co to contribute to it, both as, as writers for it, and we've got Jenny who does the editing and pulling together of what it looks like, and we've got people in the digital services team that do the actual collation of the information, and Hannah does the, um, you know, tweaking of the wording. So it's, it is, it's a collaborative in both the creation and also the sharing of knowledge. We run online presence, managing websites for Skull Common Open Access. Um, the Research Data Management website recently has been identified internationally as best practice. It receives about 3,000 visitors a month. Um, uh, the Open Access Twitter account has over 1,100 followers and the Open Data one over 1,200 followers. Uh, we live tweet our events with hashtags and we store it by them afterwards. And uh, many of the Open um, Office of Skull Common staff run their own Twitter feeds which share professional observations as well. Our blog is written by all members of the team to share experiences and ideas. We receive about 2,000 hits a month on it. Uh, we published last year 41 blogs on various aspects in terms of open research, scholarly communications, library matters. Um, and uh, when we ran the Open Access Week blogs, we've run it twice now where we run a blog a day through Open Access Week. This year, those blogs just in that week were actually <coughs> um, 1,630 times in that week alone. We also publish two monthly newsletters um, to share news achievements and opportunities in the field. So the scholarly communications one, Kaleidoscope, you'll notice the clever OSC in the middle of Kaleidoscope. So that was some discussion amongst the team about what we call this thing. Um, that's been relaunched. It warns the open access um, newsletter and we're building up the mailing list at the moment on that one. The research data management uh, newsletter on the far side has over 2,000 recipients, which is growing weekly. That caused a bit of a problem for us because MailChimp only lets you use it for free up to 2,000 participants. Once you're over 2,000, you've got to pay. So we're paying. Uh, but that's good because it reflects that people are reading it. Um, and a hugely successful scholarly communication that happened last year was our advent calendar. So we, we published an advent calendar with a, a scholarly communication item a day um, and uh, over December, and that was really, really well um, received. And in fact, it's still getting hits. Obviously, people are missing Christmas. Uh, we, uh, as Martin mentioned, we've got lots of promotional material like our uh, postcards and the banners that you can see at the back. Um, and uh, we tap into the engaged researcher trend. Now, I'm not demonstrating it because I'm just not at the moment. We do have Apollo stickers. You'll see an example of the sort of the trend to have lots of stickers on the back of your, um, of your uh, laptop. So we've got the Apollo stickers for that. Now, this is an example of some of the different types of communication channels that we have. Uh, we do things like collaborative note-taking during workshops with Google Docs and Google Forms. Um, these are really good for things like shared initiatives, like the JISC uh, software workshops and OpenCon that happen both around the country and the world and here in Cambridge. We use digital tools for sharing and presentations like Slido and Adobe Connect and Etherpad. And we share our presentations through Apollo and in SlideShare. We talk to people and we fly them with wine. Um, because 4 p.m. is a perfectly acceptable time to have a wine reception. <laughs> Um, it's not a one-way information service we're offering. Events generally involve focus groups, ideas generation and panel discussions. So we've, with our events for researchers, we're making inroads into live streaming. Um, 
It's a one, uh, this is Peter Hannah's notes. It's a one-on-one -on -one element of the global open community. I'm not 100% sure what that means, I'm sorry. I'm sure she would know. Um, but it's actually not standard in the university. Um, so we've had to do this, we've been doing a lot of working things out as we go along. Um, and this is a good example. We decided to live stream the Open Access Week material about a week before Open Access Week and Hannah just had to work out how to do it. Um, and she pulled it off like she does with everything. She's amazing. Um, we've used the expertise of the Central Sites Technical Service, um, but we'd like to be able to do this independently. Um, so we've trialled Adobe Connect at our last two events. That seems to be working, so we're looking at investing in some um, technology now. Um, we're thinking big. Uh, we, as part of the Open Concan group, we organised the satellite conference in 2015 and 2016, um, and uh, that's been it's building and it's had quite a, a successful um, interaction on the day, but is also still being accessed in terms of the live streaming and the material that we've got online. And we are bidding to host a full international conference in 2019, which, as I understand, is the first time the ULC even tried to do something like that. So we've got we've got aspirations. Okay, now I'll introduce myself. Hello, um, I'm Danny Kingsley. Um, so I'm <coughs> I'm putting you research team lead because what I'm talking about is the research that the group's doing. So, in, in addition to the conferences that we are, uh, are hosting here and the kind of workshops and events that we're hosting here, we go out a lot to other conferences and workshops. So, amongst the team, we attended over 80 events last year. And within that, we're very active. So we're not sitting in the audience just absorbing information and then maybe or not repeating it back when we get back to work. We are actually actively engaged. So we did a keynote speakers at four different events, including one where one week both Martha and I keynoted at two different con um, conferences. So we had a keynote off here beforehand to, to practice our keynotes, which was a very good experience because one, it gave people an opportunity to hear what we had to say, um, but also to feedback, and that feedback was invaluable, wasn't it, improving what, what we were saying. So that was a good, good thing which we'll probably repeat. Um, we had 18 people do sessions, uh, present sessions, two organised sessions, and two, convene, uh, two chaired them, and two convened sessions, and also ran a masterclass last year. So this is a very active engagement in the, these events. And we, we share the outcomes of the events, so we share our slides and write them up, and we share information and observation from our events through the blog. So we try and make sure that the information we're absorbing on behalf of the, of the library is shared back out into the community so that it's not something that's just a personal experience. We're also running research projects. So we've, done, we've run a, a survey, uh, this is Claire and I, have run a survey of educa the educational background of people working in scholarly communication. We're sort of interested in who are, if this is a growing area, of, of, for the library community, where are these people coming from? Who, where, because I know that where our group of people are coming from, is this typical of others? And what does that represent about what we need to do about skill sets and training people up to encourage this engagement into the future? So we had over 500 responses and um, we're in the process of uh, trying to organise recruiting a, uh, a research associate for the team to do the, the full um, text analysis so that we can have a really rich data set there. Um, Lauren is, uh, as mentioned before, is an altmetrics expert. Um, she won an altmetrics research grant last year and explored the link between online attention and inclusion in policy. So, does some, if, if something's being tweeted about and being written up in, up in the newspaper, in the newspapers, does that mean it's actually more likely to appear in policy? Which is quite important if we're talking about evidence-based policy in terms of government. Um, it was very well received, and it's been, I've been in on um, a web webinar when somebody's saying, oh, have you seen this really fantastic research, and da, 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 and people, oh, that's fine, that's fine. Um, yeah, so it's really exciting, it's been uh, really well received. Um, we're also in the process of doing an, an analysis of job advertisements in the area of scholarly communication, and Megan, who's now working at the front desk here in the library, um, came and worked with us as a volunteer for a while, and did quite a lot of the, the groundwork of that, um, because this is another way of establishing a list of skills in this area. Um, because it's a bit hard to kind of work this stuff out. Again, we're going to need the research associate to do that analysis. And we're also running a survey, we did a small survey of journal editors about the training and support services that they receive and whether or not there's a role for us there. Uh, so this refers to the grant that, um, that Lauren won, and um, so as with what we do with all of our work, we've of course blogged about it and put the information into the public domain. We're also running a pilot research project with the, with, in partnership with the Wellcome Trust to try and see if we can get the open 
research idea onto the agenda. So uh, if you remember right back at the beginning of the presentation when we talked about what our strategic goals were and we talked about the open conduct and dissemination of research. So mostly we've been talking about dissemination of research, but this bit's talking about the conduct of research. So we have through uh, several committees tried to push through the idea that Cambridge should ad ad adopt, officially adopt an open research sort of agenda. That has not been successful. We are working in a very conservative organisation. So instead what we're doing is we are trying to work from the bottom up and see if we can just do proof of concept. So with Wellcome Trust we have um, put out a call for participants in this pilot to see if they will work in an open way all the way through their research and so make their data sets available, make their notebooks available, make their null results available and see what the implications are of that kind of activity. So we've got our kick-off meeting, is it next week? Yes. Yeah, next week we've got our kick-off meeting with the teams that have volunteered. Um, so it's quite exciting to watch this space. We're also looking at future research projects. We've got a bid in through the um, Leadership Foundation for Higher Education for about 6,000, um, or 8,000, I can't remember now. Was it eight? Yeah. Um, to help us with some of the training um, programs that we're running in, term, in terms of our library community. So this is in terms of increasing the professionalism of our library community. So we've got fingers crossed on that one. We find out at the end of the uh, month. And we've also joined this uh, Centre for Evidence-Based Library and Information Practice um, network. So it's a worldwide network of people who are really interested in the idea of evidence-based research within the library community um, and practice. And so we're not quite sure what that's going to look like. Um, but we've started a Moodle um, uh, community for people who are interested in this. We're looking at trying to create professional sort of profiles of the engagement that people are within the library community already doing and the, and the publication that they're already doing to try and encourage more engagement here. So this is me again, and this time I'm talking about staffing. So what we've talked about so far is all the fantastic stuff we're doing. You've met most of the staff, and it, it looks like a really solid group of people doing solid work. Well, that's true, but underneath that is a very, very, very tenuously put together house of cards. So, this is version 24 of the staff chart. It's out of date. We're up to version 25. We're in the 25th month of the Office of Scholarly Communication to give you some idea about how quickly this changes. The colours signify where money comes from. So, the blue is the library. The red comes, and this is four people, it's come off the thing, that's four people and the repository integration manager, comes from money that we've ring-fenced out of some money that the RCUK has given us. We have no guarantee that that money will be able to be ring-fenced this coming year, so we've got that for a year. The green is on the basis we've got a two-year uh, non-recurrent grant that covers the cost of the first two years of those people. And after that, we get 25% of the cost of them from overheads. The other 75% is reliant on the success of the planning round. <coughs> so it's pretty, pretty tenuous. <coughs> what this actually means, for me, is a huge amount of human resources work. So I've talked about the tenuous finance. We've got five staff members on one-year contracts and another's a temporary staff member. We could lose half of our staff within a week. They are on one-week uh, notice periods. So the half of this whole organisation will be gone by this time next week. So in 2016 alone, I personally assessed 143 job applications and did 42 interviews. Now, those are not things that I did on my own. There's at least two other people in every single one of those environments. This is a massive, massive suck on our time. Once we finally get people in post, 27 probationary interviews last year, I wrote six PD33s to have to go back to go to grading and then get established as posts and months and months and months later they may actually be able to be advertised. So all of this stuff just takes out a huge amount of time and that's before I start actually managing anyone or doing the work. So to end on a slightly more positive note, um, so that's the kind of oh about it. And meanwhile, in spite of all of that, what we've got here is a team who are on editorial boards, they're peer reviewers for research, they're publishing articles, they're publishing book chapters, presenting at conferences including keynotes, they serve on committees, they obtain grants. So we've got an active, engaged, dynamic group of people and we're providing a world-class facility. So that's the team. <laughs> and uh, we're happy to answer any questions so of any of the group. So please feel free to make comments or ask any questions.
can understand. <laughs> yeah. The arts and humanities, kind of, the differences between the different areas in the university and how they consider data and data sharing and both access and all of that. Like, what kind of strategies are there to reach those communities that are really hard to reach already within the communities? <laughs> The honest, uh, yeah. <laughs> so the honest answer at the moment is when we pitch training, we don't mention data. Because they just run away if you mention data. I wait until they have a two hour session when the doors are locked and they can't run away. And then I say, by the way, when I said information, I meant data, you all have data. So <laughs> that's kind of what we're doing at the moment. Um, we're working on it. I'm talking to colleagues who work at arts specific institutions who've given us a few ideas about. Um, approaching individuals who have big projects as a start to try and build those relationships because a lot of it is just that they find the word data alienating. If I go in and say I'm a research data advisor, they don't, they're not interested. So um, we work on building our relationships within those faculties and I'm open to all suggestions. So if you have any good ideas, please let me know. Okay. I'll just, I'll just add from the open access side of things, we also try and modify our language as well to make sure it's really relevant to them because if you mention anything to do with science they, you know, they switch off, they don't want to know so you haven't made an effort for them so we really try and make an effort and then we're doing kind of extra sessions for them so in the PhD training programme we have sessions on book publishing and we have sessions on copyright which are really particularly relevant for them that we don't do for the, for the science students. Okay. So just another hand up here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is about the, um, the long standing relationship between data and data preservation and I wonder what kind of conversations were you were having with Blonsky fellows and were they in fact the, the, one of the ways to reach the arts and humanities is that their data is important as a very long period of social science. I mean, historical data sets get reused when the fashion comes back. So we need to be able to use them. So, um, both Mark and I were involved in the recruitment process, part of the the job applications assessed and the interviews and stuff on that list were the Polonsky ones. Um, so we have been involved right from the start. And of course, Polonsky's um, kind of lost an owner when Grant left. So they, it's, 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 it's been a, not quite what I think was the original. I think the people turned up and didn't get quite what they thought they were walking into. So that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, <coughs> we do work collaboratively with the Polonsky people quite directly. Um, Lee actually sits up now with us, the training um, Polonsky fellow. Um, is sits up in our area um, a few days a week now. They're all, is all, are all three now on the RDM project? Yes, so there is also uh, basically Polonsky fellows because as you pointed out, it's very, very related to what we are doing. So they are also part of our RDM project group, which basically, that was again an open call for all of the st stakeholders across the university who, uni across the university, sorry, who wanted to be part of this group and take part like in thinking about what are the RDM gaps, what we should be doing to make our systems more integrated. So all the Polonsky members are part of this RDM project group. And on top of what Danny mentioned, like as, as Danny said, like we are just working you know, next to each other. So both the technical person and the training person, we share the same office space. And on top of that, we have our monthly catch-up meeting. So basically, we do a, like a roundtable discussion, like where are our projects up to, what can we do to collaborate more, to make sure that our efforts are integrated. But absolutely, that's something that we've also recognized that, you know, think about data and not thinking of arts and humanities, or perhaps preservation, long-term accessibility of this data, that just can't be like that. We have to make sure that our approaches are connected. And actually, Agustina, maybe you want to talk about the group that you are chairing, because there is a special like working group, like integrating data and preservation. So if you want to tell something about this. Yes, yeah, yeah. so as part of the group, for example, I was uh, recently working uh, collaboratively with the Technical Polonsky Fellows. So we, for example, ran uh, an analysis of what are the kind of files that we have uh, as research data in the entire repository. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is because uh, the moment the repository is not really designed for preservation. So what we are doing as well, working closely with the Polonsky Fellows, is to try and explore new tools that we can actually use together with the repository to, to do long-term preservation. So that's the key aspects, I think. Mm -hmm. Can you have a... Yeah. Um, on the PhD digitization, how is that... Um, isn't that mirroring the same thing that Ethos is doing with other universities, um, where if you submit a PhD now, it will automatically be digitized and uploaded, and you can request it whichever university you're at through Ethos? Is that doing the same job as that, or...? No, you may be slightly misunderstanding what Ethos does. Um, so Ethos lists all of the theses, 
Um, and what they ask is that if there's a digitised version, they ask if they can host a copy of that digitised version in their repository. We've chosen to say no to that. We want to them to direct people to our repository. They charge money for the for the access to the ethos. In terms of it's it's money for the the method of delivery. Um, so they'll charge money if, you put, if they, they dump it down onto a CD, for example, and send it to you. Um, and we don't really believe that, that in that philosophy. We feel that the things should just come here and also that we should, con should control our own research output. So the, the, digital li uh, the British Library did digitise some years ago. How many of that off? 14,000? Yeah. yeah. 14,000 theses um, uh, the, onto microfilm, and that's the project that Matthias was talking about, of which we're taking 10% because we couldn't afford to pay... They, they said, look, we've got this great deal. We can, we've got these um, microfilmed versions of your thesis for a, three pounds? I can't remember how much. It, was, no, it wasn't that much. It wasn't as much as we charge here um, to digitise. Um, we, we can put it onto into a digital format. So we had to go through this quite a complex process about choosing which ones. So we, we're paying £20,000 to get the 1,400 digitised into a digital form with OCR on them so they're usable. Um, and then we're putting those into the repository, but the remainder will just have to sit on microfilm there. So everything is registered in Ethos and is fine, discoverable through Ethos, but they're not doing some magic digitisation on our behalf. It'd be great if they were, but they're not. It costs a lot of money. Yeah. Any other comments? No? Everyone's happy? Okay, we've got, um, Claire's got her posters up the back. Where are you, Claire? Oh, there you are. Um, you've got, you do, and you're happy to talk to people about that, aren't you? We've got all of our material, so please feel free to come and ask individual questions if you don't want to um, sort of speak out loudly. Um, so thanks so much for your time, everybody. I hope you found it interesting, and all of our stuff's online. You can look us up. We're everywhere. Um, so thank you very much. Have a wonderful year, and we hope to see you again this time next year. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>